Thank you. It's a great honor and a privilege to be here today. And I'm going to give you an overview of what came before the demo. In fact, I think of it as the real demo. It was what Doug himself called the public debut of a dream. And you would think, oh, well, that's got to be the demo. That was public. But no, it was a 1962 research report. As is often the case with what Doug leaves us, we think we understand. Public debut of a dream, dream, demo, no. It's this 1962 report, and he wrote those words, the public debut of a dream, in a letter to one of his intellectual heroes, Vannevar Bush. What he meant was the dream was a conceptual framework, completed as a project report for the Air Force Office of Scientific Research. When he wrote to Vannevar Bush, it was a work in progress. He was racing to finish by the time his friend J.C.R. Licklider was to arrive in Washington, D.C., a report that Doug insisted was a search report, not a research report, because very few people could yet understand what Doug was looking for. So what is a conceptual framework? This is what happens when you invite an English professor to speak to you. <laughs> we can start by saying what it is not. A conceptual framework is not a logo, slogan, motto, or brand. A conceptual framework is not operational policies. It's not even a set of clearly expressed directions. In fact, conceptual frameworks come before directions. It's a compass, not a map. And Doug makes this clear throughout the 1962 report. Conceptual frameworks are ideas to think about. Even more to the point, they're ideas to think with. A conceptual framework like the Magna Carta or like the Constitution. I believe we can all agree that however stimulating it may be as a tally-ho, move fast and break things is not a conceptual framework. <laughs> a conceptual framework aims to keep our thinking straight, open, and adequate to the occasion. In that respect, a conceptual framework closely resembles a work of philosophy. The heart of the framework is what Doug called HLAM slash T, by which he meant humans using language, artifacts, and methodologies in which they are trained. This elegant expression captured the systems approach Doug advanced, the complexly interrelated factors and what he envisioned not merely as human-computer symbiosis, but as a human-computer co-evolutionary ecosystem. This distillation catalyzed everything that would follow, including the demo. Yet it also describes, as Doug himself knew from his rigorous habits of self-observation, his own process in writing the 1962 report. His training was many thousands of hours of research and writing. Here's just a sample of the bibliography that Doug compiled for the early stages of his work on this conceptual framework. His methods, as, they in, as he insisted they must be in a truly systems approach, were mixed methods, engineering, creative writing, a kind of game design, anthropology, linguistics, architecture, and the many modalities of what we now call information science, a field Doug helped to invent. They're all in this report. His artifacts in 1962 were mostly books, articles, a dictaphone, telephone, typewriter, pencil, pen, paper, staples, many of which have been largely superseded by the artifacts he and his lab went on to invent. Doug's language is English, but with idioms drawn from many different registers, some of them quite unusual for an engineer, as he himself acknowledges in that famous report. Two in particular seemed to catch people's imagination. The first was figure two, the illustration in which Doug demonstrates augmentation by depicting its opposite, a pencil de-augmented by tying it to a brick. Doug had a way with earnest satire, and I think of this pencil with the brick page as the precursor to the question he would ask in later years. Did you ride your tricycle to work today? Doug's other memorably puckish moment in the 1962 report was the fictional character he named Joe. Now, Joe is a kind of Engelbart in disguise. 
He's explaining this augmented world, and Doug pokes fun at himself by characterizing Joe as just a little preachy. But Joe is a Virgil who guides us into the world that existed so far only in Engelbart's imagination. That Joe section in the 1962 report might well be considered an early version of the demo. And Joe is, of course, a human being, one who understands H L A M slash T, one who seeks what Doug called very memorably a way of life in an integrated domain. Doug writes, we do not speak of isolated clever tricks that help in particular situations. We refer to a way of life in an integrated domain where hunches, cut and try, intangibles, and the human feel for a situation usefully coexist with powerful concepts, streamlined terminology and notation, sophisticated methods, and high-powered electronic aids. Those were the first words I read by Doug Engelbart when I stumbled across the 1962 report uh, late in my own career, in 2004, I was immediately re reminded of some words by T.S. Eliot. This will seem a strange connection, but I hope it's in the spirit of Doug's integrated domain. Eliot wrote of the poet John Donne, a thought to Donne was an experience. It modified his sensibility. When a poet's mind is perfectly equipped for its work, it is constantly amalgamating disparate experience. The ordinary man's experience is chaotic, irregular, fragmentary. The latter falls in love or reads Spinoza, and these two experiences have nothing to do with each other or with the noise of the typewriter or the smell of cooking. In the mind of the poet, these experiences are always forming new holes. That integrated domain, that amalgamation of new holes is crucial. By contrast, we tend to want to think about the L or the A or the M or the T separately because it's easier, it's more efficient. Funders are always in love with isolated clever tricks that help in particular situations. But Doug understood that choosing a single point of intervention is a recipe for disaster. Our interventions must always have the system in view. Without the integrated domain, domain we will certainly break things, most of all ourselves. Augmenting human intellect, a conceptual framework, remains the most powerful and comprehensive articulation of Doug's vision. Yet, while this is a profoundly personal work, uh, it is, I believe, a mistake to say that Doug worked largely in isolation. He wrote this from the depths of his being, but all along the way, he submitted his work to the scrutiny and often the baffled or even hostile critiques of others. And in fact, those critiques, as painful as they must have been to suffer through with their misunderstandings and condescension, they were helpful to Doug. Studying the process of his thinking from 1959 to 1963, I can see Doug worrying, revising, revising again, reaching out to various audiences, and never giving up. And I can see his more sympathetic colleagues reaching out to Doug despite their own bewilderment and doubts, trying to help. Here is a poignant example from March 1962. Doug's notes on a pamphlet his boss, Jerry Noyes, lent him, a pamphlet called How to Communicate Ideas. You can see what he learned from this little pamphlet in the bold, even poetic prose of the 1962 report, a report that becomes a declaration, even a manifesto. You've probably heard of J.C.R. Licklider. We just heard of Bob Taylor two of the heroes who eventually funded the work that led to the 1968 demo. But there are hidden figures in this story, too. As 1960 drew to its close, Doug found at last what all writers yearn for, his ideal readers, and even more to the point, colleagues of similar daring who had money to invest in his vision. When he got his grant, he came into contact with this woman, Rowena Swanson, the program officer, who coached, cajoled, teased, pushed, pushed and sometimes dragged Doug through the last stages of his monumental writing task. It was Rowena Swanson, a person of keen intelligence and deep insights and a zany sense of humor and a taste for eccentrics who knew what Doug could do and gave him the encouragement every writer craves and some never find. Doug turned in the draft of part one of his final report in early March 1962 and just a few days later Rowena Swanson had this response to Doug a response that Doug must have been hoping for for many, many years. She writes, Dear Doug, I read your report last night. 
Now I know what you meant when you said it had become something different from what you had originally intended. It may well be that what you have said has been said by others before you, and that I, through ignorance, am not aware of those other expositions. But I somehow doubt this, at least in part, and I marvel at the capabilities and the harnessing of them by one human being, which have resulted in what I read last night. There is nothing I have to ask you about what you wrote, because it all fits together so beautifully. Eventually, it would be a gem, nay, a gold mine of 133 pages, with an appendix of over 200 names and organizations, uh, with biographical information that my research assistant, Laura Kramer, has very kindly put together over the course of my work. This is an astonishing document that Rowena herself wrote about not long afterward in an article called Psychops and Computers about the country where the one-eyed man is king, a good description of Dyke Engelbart and his vision. The first printing of this report ran out, and when people saw Swanson's article, more requests came in. And when those requests came in, Doug said, we're on a second printing. We'll send it to you as soon as we can. And now I come to my conclusion. In one of his last public appearances, Doug Engelbart accepted the honor of becoming a fellow of the New Media Consortium. And I was there that day, and I watched and listened as Doug stood beside his daughter, Christina, and said these words of thanks. Well, this is, you know, a trite thing to say. I'm overwhelmed, but I sit here just feeling overwhelmed. You know, I wasn't doing all of those things in order to sit here and get something like this. It's been so many years, and I still have dreams about how the world could be. Anyway, I appreciate this very much, so thank you, thank you, Doug Engelbart said, and then he was seated. From the public debut of his dream in 1962 until the end of his life, Doug never stopped dreaming of how the world could be. And in his stirring and precise eulogy for Doug, Ted Nelson reminded us of what we must always celebrate about this man. Ted said, and I quote, no one ever had such a soaring view of human potential as Douglas Carl Engelbart. And he gave us wings to soar with him, though his mind flew on ahead where few could see, end quote. I believe that if you want to see Doug's wings, you will find them not at the mother of all demos, splendid as that flight is in that epical event. No, you will find Doug Engelbart's wings and the pair he left for you in that 1962 report, Augmenting Human Intellect, a Conceptual Framework. That report and how it came to be is the subject of my current research, supported by the Engelbart Institute. Early next year, I will help to lead a three-week online exploration of Doug's framework, an exploration I hope you will want to be part of. The centerpiece of this learning experience will be an opportunity for us to read and respond to Doug's magnificent 1962 framework. Together, we will annotate the document using a wonderful online annotation affordance called Hypothesis. You can read about the experience at framework.thoughtvectors.net. I hope you'll join us. Thank you.